So this is a little bit of a story actually about how you might convince your boss and manager or your organization to take Kotlin. Uh, for me, it's actually an interesting connection to what Brian was talking about as well, because obviously language is a, uh, an essential part of how we do work and form part of you know, our ad identity. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit about our journey, about why we sort of went to Kotlin, and talk a little bit about some of the trade-offs that we thought of. And hopefully, for those of you who don't get to do something like Kotlin, or if you're trying to influence your organization to pick up a new language, I can give you some advice about how to do this. I work for a company called N26. Uh, anyone a customer here? Hey, great. Uh, so we're actually a German bank based in Berlin, uh, we're mobile only, and uh, our mission is really to be the bank the world loves to use. And it's not a word, a sentence that you often hear bank and love in the same sentence. Uh, we really focus on uh, providing a, a beautiful, simple interface to banking. Uh, and an example is one of our products called Spaces, which is really allowing you to think about how you manage money in a very simple and easy to use fashion. Now, I'm in a new role called a chief scientist, but previously I was the CTO for N26, and during this time, we were discussing about should we actually adopt something like Kotlin? Uh, so I had an engineer come to me and ask me, Patrick, can we do Kotlin? And I was like, okay, well, I've played around with this, but what would you do if you were in my position? You're in charge of an organization and you had to make choices thinking about the environment in which people work. Do you accept every single language that everyone comes to you with and say, I'd like to do this language? What can you do? And what are the trade-offs? Now, my background is actually helping people grow in their sort of technical leadership. And architecture and trade-offs are one of the ideas that I end up teaching a lot of people. It's one of those things when we talk about architectural thinking sort of disappears from how we work. And yet, it's an explicit decision-making process that we as programmers make every day when we're thinking about what are the trade-offs for the programs and business benefits that we make. What's the maintenance costs of choices that we make? And how easy can we model some of those applications? So today, we're going to be going through a little bit of a journey, and I want to give you a little bit of a background about how uh, this came out to be. I want to talk about why we decided to perhaps start exploring even choosing a new language, uh, talk about maybe how. And this is a very interesting process, because often when we talk about one language versus another, we're often thinking about a feature that a language has, or something that we read that was cool that we could do in another language. But you don't often hear about how does an organization actually adopt a new language? What are the challenges? What are the problems that come a year after you adopt a language? And so I want to give you a little bit of an insight so that you can go back to your organizations and think about what would be a good way that you can actually help your organization feel more comfortable with this. And of course, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the outcome, uh, because this is now actually quite some time since we've gone on this journey and perhaps reflect with you on some lessons learned, and hopefully you have some insights that you can use in your different organizations. So let's start with background. And this is actually very apt with what Brian talked about this morning, which is about programming language choice. Now, it's very interesting because we're here at J Barcelona, uh, Java and JVM conference, and uh, I've done a lot of different talks at different conferences that are in different communities as well. So .NET communities, web communities, JavaScript communities. Uh, and it's very fascinating because there is something that we all get attached to with the community and uh, what we have. And a question that you often want to ask is, why is this programming language such a big deal? Why is it so important to us individually? And why is it so important for an organization as well? Now, one of the books I published uh, a couple of years back was called Building Evolutionary Architectures. And in our day and age, we really need to think about applications and about how quickly can we actually evolve and change those systems. And so in this book, we actually explored this question. What happens if you architected a system designed for change? Now, it's quite interesting because I've been programming for almost 20 years, and those of you who were programming back then probably realize how slow the process of building software was. You know, you'd be lucky if you could actually get a release out every six months. Uh, you'd be lucky if you did three months. Doing deployments daily is very different, and we work in a very different ecosystem. And as a result, the way that we think about our tooling and our languages, we also need to think about this. And so when you look at a system and you think about, well, how does it actually adapt to change? And how reversible is that change? This is a very interesting question when you think about a platform language. 
So if we think about different sort of things that we use in our daily life, so if we think about a function or a method, right? You know, we write a new function. What happens if we get it wrong? Well, it's pretty easy. We can actually just rewrite a new function. If we use a library, okay, so we find that there's a bug in a library. What happens if we actually want to swap out a different library? Okay, well, maybe we have to actually find a good replacement, find parts of the code base that's using that library and swap that out. That's relatively easy. Now, if we use a framework, so how many of you use, say, Spring Boot or something like this? Right, okay. And so you build an application based on Spring Boot, and then you find out at some point uh, it's end of life for some reason. Now, you've built a lot of things on top of Spring Boot now, and there is obviously the cost of then thinking about how do you migrate that to a different environment, different framework. And that's much higher in cost as well, particularly the longer lived an application has. And now when you're thinking about a programming language, and you think about your build tools, your infrastructure, the libraries and frameworks that you've used in that programming language, the ability to support and monitor and understand the quirks of running that language in production, that's a much, much higher cost. And so when we're actually thinking about a new language from our own individual developer perspective, we're actually thinking often about you know, this one feature or enablement that we have, but actually the cost of change to the entire system can be much, much larger. And this is where we have to think about that trade-off. And so we have to often think about, if we end up with different types of programming languages, there's actually a higher cost of reversibility, potentially, depending on how much we invest in that different direction. Now, if you've been around for a while, like I have, it's very fascinating to understand different languages that have emerged. And probably in your time frame, you've seen a few as well. Uh, now, I've done probably about five different major programming languages building systems over a couple of years. And so I don't really identify with one, even though my background is mostly Java. And so let's have a look at some of the different types of languages. I have to actually abstract out quite a lot of them, because uh, if you ever go to Wikipedia and look at programming languages, you'll be amazed at how many there are out there. But let's simplify this. So let's have a look at some of the languages from the 70s. Uh, and some of these are probably things that you might even use today if you're doing more embedded type program. I actually did quite a lot of Perl very early on, but don't tell anyone. Uh, and then if we go to the uh, 80s uh, or 90s, we might have a look at some of the newer sort of languages like Python, which is becoming more popular now with machine language. Ruby actually emerged, and this is actually where the birth of Java came as well, as in JavaScript. Now, in the noughties or the 2000s, uh, we ended up things with things like C Sharp, Scala, and Clojure. And more recently, we've seen the emergence of things like Go, Swift, Rust, and Kotlin. Now, it's quite fascinating when you look at this evolution and pace, because there's a couple of things that this will tell you. So one is these won't be the last programming languages we'll have to learn. Uh, and two, these languages emerge because they're solving interesting problems for us. And if we look at perhaps the history behind each of these languages, we might start to understand and appreciate what each person or creator was trying to accomplish with each of these different languages. So if we have a look at some of the links here, some of the ones that we might have are, you know, the one that we're most familiar with is Java. And actually, there's a couple of reasons why it was really popular. So memory management was a really big deal back in the day. How many of you had to have really had to explicitly think about memory management and releasing that today, right? We've got garbage collection and, and magical things that can actually solve our problems and help us focus on actually solving interesting business problems. Now, C Sharp was the .NET equivalent for that, and I didn't actually include VB here, but actually this was an actually interesting move for uh, the Microsoft ecosystem when they were trying to shift people off procedural programming languages more to object orientation, and they had the benefit of actually learning from mistakes in Java as well. And so it's actually quite interesting about sort of seeing how language creators take the best of one language and then they try to improve and increment on that. Now you'll see in, uh, is with Scala and Clojure a little bit of that explosion of functional programming and trying to uh, improve some of that. Uh, and those of you who have done Scala maybe understand perhaps some of the difficulties of actually applying that. And I'll talk a little bit more about Clojure later. And this is where Kotlin for us was very interesting because Kotlin for us was a potential alternative to seeing where the future of Java was going. So when we actually started to understand uh, Kotlin, uh, this was sort of late 2017. So you know, the future of Java and Java 8 was a little bit questionable. 
Of course, then there's Java 9, 10, and 11 that came out in sort of 2018. But, you know, do we sit on an ecosystem which is, has, hasn't been evolving for quite some time and also sort of at the mercy of a mega couple of mega conglomerates who can't really agree? Uh, or do we end up choosing something that seems to have picked a particular style and also opinionation that will come through in that language? And so this was an interesting thought experiment of if you were in the position of leading a technical team, uh, what would be the right choice? What do you allow or not allow? This is really easy if you're dealing with your own individual choice. But if you're sort of dealing with the longer term responsibility for an entire organization, particularly a bank, the choices of irreversibility and impact are a lot higher. And so this is where I want to explain some of the trade-offs. Now, for me, when my uh, engineer approached me asking, can we do Kotlin? Uh, I thought about this quite deeply. And, you know, of course I could have either said immediately yes or no. Uh, but one of the things I like to do is actually do deliberate thinking. It's one of the things I've learned through architectural thinking, is thinking about what are some of the trade-offs and what are some of the reasons we want to make a choice. And so one of the first things I was kind of asking is like, why is this potentially a contentious choice? Is this just because one personal style of developer would like to use Kotlin and they're kind of sick of using Java 8? Now, one thing that I kind of look for for different languages is uh, some different aspects about long-term long uh, balance, right? So when you're responsible for a bank and an organization and a product that will last for decades, hopefully, uh, you have to think about you know, what does that mean for the evolvability of that system? Now, one of the indicators that I tend to look for are things like community. Now, it's quite interesting because PHP is a very large community, and PHP and WordPress actually run 60% of the internet. So it's actually quite interesting when you think about that because often, and I've heard a number of jokes about PHP here, is that you know, it's actually a productive language solving a certain type of problem, and there's a really large community around it. I actually remember when I set up my blog, uh, now almost 15 years ago, uh, sort of thinking about which blogging platform. Back then you had things like JRoller, you could have set up your own Java blogging platform, movable type, and I actually chose WordPress. And part of this was because of the community. Because with the community, you're going to have a lot of people who've solved problems before for you, and if you don't know something, you probably can reach out to people to understand who you can go to. I think the other thing about community is that, you know, we have so many interesting problems to solve, and with the birth of open source, we get to build on sort of the shoulders of giants. And so it's actually quite interesting to see the evolution of something like WordPress. Uh, they're taking in the feedback of problems of previous versions, improving that, and then creating a richer ecosystem. And so for me, this is an interesting thing about, you know, is this uh, potential new tool going to have a very large community around it, or is this community going to grow? Now, one of the other interesting things about why languages are a bit of a challenge is what Brian alluded to this morning, and this is what I call identity. So in my leadership course, I often talk about this wonderful book called Difficult Conversations, and sometimes there are different types of conversations that you might have between people. So often in programming, uh, in programming land, we like to think that we are in a what happened type of conversation. And this is often about the very logical, right? So uh, here is why we should use something, here's the benefits, and of course, here's the answer. But often, we sometimes have an identity conversation. So when somebody is saying, you know, functional programming will be uh, the world, somebody like Brian was thinking about, oh, what does this mean about me? Am I a dinosaur like he pictured up in his keynote? And this is the identity conversation. And this is where it gets quite contentious when you're actually talking about do we do one language versus another? Because it often comes down to what is your identity? And it's quite interesting if you start to detach yourself from one community only and start to, to connect with the different types of community because you become open to more ideas. Now, one of the other challenges with adopting a new language is often about a fear. Right, so part of this is often I've invested so much time learning these things, the familiarity with a particular environment. Now I have to go and learn all of these new things in a different area. Now I find that interesting because I hear other programmers who say, I'm bored of doing the same thing over and over. I would like to learn new things as well. And so there's an interesting thing where change can actually mean a lot of fear for some people. And when you're thinking about a new type of tool, a new type of framework, a new language, 
uh, you have to think about what fears people might have and also how can you actually address that and make it safe for people to move into a learning space. Now, another reason it's quite contentious is we get distracted with ideologies. And so we end up with conversations like, my language is more object-oriented, or my language is more functional, or I re I, what we're trying to say is my language is more pure. And to that, I think we can laugh. Because at the end of the day, we have to rem remind ourselves that these debates aren't really helpful. We're here really trying to solve interesting business problems, not sort of have theoretical debates about which language is more pure than another one. Now, if you're an avid book reader like I am, I really like Terry Pratchett's books. And he has this wonderful quote, which it's useful to go out of this world and see it from the perspective of another one. And this is indeed the message that Brian was trying to talk about this morning, which is about collecting different paradigms, seeing a problem from a different space. Because seeing it from a different perspective might actually give you a more elegant, a more simple solution to solve a different type of problem. And because we live in an ever-growing, more complex environment, we need to build our toolkit, we need to build our perspectives to understand where we might apply these tools in different contexts. Now, I totally understand why uh, um, this engineer approached me and asked us if we go to Kotlin. And I've been in this position myself, right? So I totally understand what you want. Uh, and often when a developer is wanting to do something different, there's a couple of different things that can motivate them. So one of them might be that you're wanting to learn something, right? So uh, I've done Java and Spring for the next last 10 sort of years. I want to do something new. I want to have a new challenge to learn something different. I get that. And actually, a new language actually probably offers you an opportunity to learn new paradigms potentially as well, which are also just as useful. I think as part of the process of building programs, one of the things that we have when we solve a problem is that we get a bit of a kick. We get into a flow state. And uh, when we solve complex problems in a simple, elegant to use way, we end up having fun as part of that. And so when we learn something new and we apply that in a place where there's actually some use, we all get fun. And I really want to encourage also an environment where people can have fun at work. I think that's very healthy and important. Now, at the end of the day, most of us are probably working for some sort of commercial entity. And one of the other reasons why you want to use something is, you know, okay, Java might be a little bit verbose. We do have IDEs, but there's a lot of code that we end up having to write. And so often one of the sort of excuses for a new language is we will be more productive with this, right? So we can learn because a language, a newer language may have learned from the past of trying to make the common things that are hard easier. And we see that with the evolution of languages, right? We're trying to abstract away those technical accidental complexity problems into the base platform languages so that we don't have to worry about that. So we can actually focus on much more interesting business level problems. Now, when you think about decisions, we're thinking about what we want. But of course, you also have to think about what worries about others. And I want to give you insights into what I was worried about as CTO when uh, somebody approached me. And these are the things that you need to address if you're going back to your organization, trying to influence people about adopting something. And this is where you want to think about what are uh, feelings and, and data that you can use to address each of these. So one of them is, of course, community size, right? So I talked about that before. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? I think a good indicator for me with Kotlin was uh, Google officially said we will now adopt Kotlin as an official Google uh, Android platform language. Now that's super important because Google's not a small entity and they will continue to invest in that. I think JetBrains is also a very large uh, company now and it's not some sort of startup that has uh, sort of uh, um, invented a new language because if you're thinking about them suddenly stopping support for the language, what would that mean for your organization or your tooling? Now, another thing that somebody in a management role will often worry about is obviously talent, right? So uh, I'm quite realistic in that everyone doesn't really stay in the same job all the time. And this is a common concern, is that what happens when somebody comes on board? How do you find people that can help you continue on and evolve your applications? How do you uh, add new features while sort of maintaining existing applications? So people who've worked in a more traditional bank will know maybe the challenges with COBOL programmers is that they're becoming far and far fewer in between. If you talk about the closure community, I've heard about organizations having to rewrite applications because they can't find enough people to learn closure or to hire closure people. And so this is obviously a concern that you need to think about. 
Um, and one of the interesting things that I found about Kotlin was that they've really focused on easy to learn. And it's actually a very easy path for Java developers to move into Kotlin, and it's not so complex from that perspective. Now, one interesting takeaway from systems thinking uh, that I've learned is something called unintended consequences. So we make decisions because we think that they're the right decisions at the time. And when we balance out all of these pros and cons, we're convinced this is absolutely the way to go. But unintended consequences are the things that happen maybe two, three, six months later, maybe a year later, that we couldn't anticipate, that we don't know. Now, if you've done Scala, perhaps the compilation uh, versioning issue was an unintended consequence, right? So we found out that Scala's compile process was very long, and then uh, if you change the significant version of your Scala libraries, you had to recompile all of your libraries in the same fashion as well. Now, that's a whole bunch of accidental complexity, but wasn't intended, right? So nobody had gone out to say, let's make this really complex with the next versioning. These are things that you can't really plan for, and they have an impact on your ecosystem when you're actually developing. And so one of the things that we were trying to set out to do was really understand, perhaps, what could be potential unintended consequences that we're not even on the radar for that we want to watch out for, right? So it's the unknown unknowns that you want to worry about. Now, the other aspect in an organization is when you're focused on what you do, you're often thinking about uh, optimizing for your own workflow, and that's completely understandable. When you have a different perspective in an organization and you're at a management level, you're worried about optimizing for the entire organization, and you're trying to align for the uh, overall uh, op productivity of the organization. And so one of the terms that I often talk about is how much organizational entropy have you got, right? And this is where you can have maybe too much entropy for an organization, uh, or maybe not enough entropy where you don't get enough innovation. And so one of the interesting things about cultivating a, an interesting workplace is trying to make sure you have a good enough balance of all of those things. You can probably understand this if you operate at a team level, right? So if you have a team uh, of five engineers, and you have 12 different programming languages, uh, you probably have too much entropy, right? Everyone probably is specialists in their own areas. It's really hard to learn the new toolkits of everyone else. And you end up with different silos and too much chaos, right? And because there's different patterns and too much to keep on top of, it's really hard to share knowledge and to share experiences. And it probably ends up in a place where you end up with people focused on different verticals. Now, you can apply this theory to a larger organization where if you go to microservices land and you say, OK, so microservices can be developed in their different programming languages, that's fine. The question is, what's the right level of team size to microservices and how much variation can you have? Now, I can't give you the right answer. You have to sort of choose for your own sort of organization. But one of the preferences that we've had in our organization is we wanted the ability for engineers to move from team to team. And so we wanted to have some common infrastructure tooling, right? So if you go from one team to another team, uh, then you want to understand how the build process works for one microservice versus another different type of microservice. You want to be familiar with perhaps some of the logging libraries, some of the infrastructure uh, monitoring tools that are kind of similar. And they, are, they tend to be similar in the same programming language. And so we said for the back-end services, we would try to have one or two different languages. So we started off with Java, and then we were thinking about going to Kotlin. Now, it's quite interesting because historically, our organization actually had um, some bad experiences already. So before I joined, one of the teams had tried a TypeScript uh, back-end service uh, and a Scala back-end microservice, and both had bad experiences with those languages. And um, one of the unintended consequences is you can't just simply throw those services away because they're actually functional. And you have now organizational tech debt as a result. So more entropy that you have to manage and then think about how do you migrate that away at some point. What we didn't want to have is more microservices in those languages which we didn't want to have, only to have to migrate them away again. And so this is an interesting concept when you think about entropy because you have to deal with the longer term consequences as well. And you're trying to balance this off. And this is very interesting if you take a multi-year look, particularly as an organization and its services. So if you think about reuse, one of the interesting things we've been able to do by sort of consolidating on a common sort of back-end platform is that 
when a team solves a certain problem, so for instance, we had a, uh, a common sort of circuit breaking pattern in the library of dealing with connections to other services, uh, people can write to a library utility that becomes useful, not just for one team, but they can actually then share it with other teams as well. Now, this is only possible, it's not enforced, but it's only possible because people share similar tooling and platforms. Now, if people had a TypeScript backend and a Scala backend and a Java backend, then people wouldn't really potentially be able to use that same common library. And so there's been some really great uh, um, ability for us to share a consistent uh, library because we share a common sort of language that we all use. Now, the other side that I was worried about was definitely about the learnability. Right? So uh, let's say you go to your boss and say, oh, we're going to take up this language, but I'm sorry, we're going to have to stop development for six months as we learn everything about it. Right? Nobody will say yes to that, because right? that's quite scary, particularly in a startup land where you want to ship quickly and evolve your, your, your product. And so learnability is quite an important uh, aspect to test for your organization. Now, I can't say how familiar your teams are because a programming language in its environment will be dependent on, obviously, the background of all the people that you've had. Perhaps your organization already does a lot of things with Emacs and Lisp, so Clojure may actually be very learnable for your organization. And so these are some of the, the explorations that you have to think. But I've definitely seen Java programmers try to learn Clojure, only to have to learn how Emacs works, only to understand how does the environment work before they can actually even start writing a Hello World program. Right? So they have to learn a lot of different layers. And so this is another element that you'd want to address if you're trying to convince somebody to go that way. Now, like everyone, and I've been in this place as well, of trying to convince people to use a new tool, right? So I was a consultant before, working for 14 years, and part of the role is trying to encourage people to adopt newer things. And so one thing I'm worried about is optimism bias, right? Everything looks great when we're trying to sell something new. Everything is the perfect world. OO will solve all problems. Functional programming will solve all problems. But we know that's not necessarily true, right? We can convince ourselves, and that can rub off on other people, and we have to think about how do we balance that out actually with data as well and to test for this and be where we can be overly optimistic and be blinded by data when it's actually telling us other things. Now, this is very interesting if you're actually trying to measure this because we don't have a great measure of how good we are at software, right? So Martin Fowler has this great article called Cannot M Measure Productivity. And how would you measure productivity? Would it be things like lines of code? Right? But you know, if you actually solve a problem really simply, you may not need to write all those lines of code. Is it about the number of features? Well, you know, like dealing with maybe a web app where maybe you can churn out more visual features versus a very complex scalable application, they're very different sort of elements. They're not comparable. Perhaps it's about effort. No, we definitely don't want to go there. Otherwise, we get into velocity games and crazy estimation, right? So we don't have a great way of actually measuring productivity. Um, and for me, uh, what I was really looking for is making sure that we could actually still have a good pace of delivery. So at N26, what this meant is we were looking at number of deployments, so could people still continue to make changes, but also were we still sort of making impact to the business plans, right? So were we actually delivering value to our customers? And so as we're adopting new language, I'd be like looking to make sure that we're actually still delivering value and not suddenly stopping for three months to learn something and then move on. Now, for me, there were a couple of specific no-goes when we were actually thinking about a new language. Uh, and this is more my personal preference rather than it is for anything. So one of them was definitely not an early version of something, right? So uh, for our field, we deal with money and we want security. So we don't want to be dealing with a 0.1 version of a programming language uh, only to find out it was an academic experiment that was going to then die off at some point, right? Um, this is another thing is that we didn't want an experimental language, right? So uh, I think this is an interesting thing if you think about the philosophy behind different programming languages. Uh, I've studied Scala quite a lot, and you know, one of the interesting things is knowing it comes from an academic background of trying to understand how many different ways can you represent a concept in the language. And that's really cool as an experimental thing, but actually when you're a programmer and you're dealing with this in a commercial environment, you end up having to deal with what I call programmer style wars, right? 
So you have seven different ways of doing things, and now you have a debate with your team about which one of those seven ways do you actually want to implement it. And so for me, it's actually quite important to have a strongly opinionated programming language to help guide you uh, so you don't have to make those complex decisions and actually you can focus your effort on solving real business problems. The other thing I would definitely be looking for or sort of a, a countersign for is if you have a shrinking community, right? So if the community is either not growing or it's static, um, but particularly if it's sort of going down. Uh, and if you have looked at sort of things like the Red Monk programming survey or uh, Stack Overflow questions or Google Trends, there's actually very positive signs with Kotlin today as well. So we've talked about the background, we talked about the why. I want to talk a little bit about how time actually passed for us overall. Right? So let's have a look at the sequence of events of what happened. So I joined in about August 2017, and I had one engineer come to me and ask, hey, Patrick, can we do Kotlin? Uh, and at that time, you know, there was a lot of things going on. I was just coming on board, and of course, I was like, hmm, I'm not so sure, right? So we have to think about this quite a bit, and you know, we do want to make a decision quite quickly, but we don't want to just simply do it off the cuff, knowing that there could be unintended consequences. Now, we have this thing called Get Stuff Done Days, and so we decided actually we would use these to actually test out what it would be like playing around with Kotlin. So for us, Get Stuff Done Days, uh, every six weeks, we have two days where engineers can down tools, they don't work on anything, and they can do whatever they like. So they can do some training programs online, they can do workshops with each other, or they can actually fix something that they've been itching to fix, you know, write a tool that they've wanted to, to uh, write. And during this uh, Get Stuff Done Days, we had a collection of backend engineers that were actually playing around with Kotlin to learn a little bit more about what that actually meant. Now, I'm not a person who believes in having only top-down decisions. Sometimes it's important to have a clear direction, but with something such as important like a programming language, I really wanted to make sure we had a very inclusive discussion as we discussed this choice of programming language. It's a very sensitive topic, as we've talked about. And so one of the interesting things we then did after playing around with Kotlin was then to form a working group. And we've now actually made this a bit more of an official uh, sort of technique at N26. So if we have a certain problem that we need to solve across our entire organization, it doesn't make sense for me to come along and make a decision because I'm often in a different context. It also doesn't really make sense for a single developer in a team to make a, a decision because they're also not probably going to optimize for the entire organization. And so what we have is uh, we have principal engineers who are kind of like architects looking over the entire organization, looking for common problems across the organization, and then they can actually ask things like, is this a topic we want to address? If so, let's create a working group. And so it's a small set of passionate engineers from across the organization, so it's not everyone from every product team, but people who feel very strongly about this, and then they form together to help move a topic forward. And so they'll gather input from other people or they'll run certain experiments, but the purpose is a small focus group to help address a technical problem across the entire organization. Now, for our Kotlin working group, we asked them to do a couple of different things. So one of them was really to collect data and facts. Right? So uh, we don't want to just simply compare what is promised by us on some sheet and then make a decision, or we didn't just want to have one person's opinion just simply say we should just adopt Kotlin. We actually wanted to go through the process of collecting data and facts. And so we asked them to actually come up with a summary document that actually wrote out uh, topics like unintended consequences by experimentation, understanding how hard it was for somebody to learn. So take an engineer, get them to try to do a task, and see how complex it was for them to actually test. And then also to be more productive. Now, as I said, this is really hard to uh, measure, but one of the uh, activities that our working group had was actually to try to give somebody a simple task that we would have in our environment that's a bit more sort of full stack from end to end. So if you think about more of a service to data to back with events, monitoring, all of that, uh, there were a couple of those different tasks to understand how hard or how much quicker it would be and how more complex or how simpler the code would look to see if it helped solve our problems that we have in our environment. So the working group set off, they went around to different teams that were maybe experimenting with, uh, with uh, um, Kotlin during Get Stuff Done days and through other activities, and then they tried to put together a summary document through this. 
Now, part of this wasn't really just then saying, okay, we have this data, let's make a decision. Uh, it was quite important because we had other people who didn't necessarily have time, but they wanted opinions or input on this. And so the working group wanted to also share those observations as well. So one of the other um, activities that we have as an organization is a technology-wide lightning talk session every, every week. And so this is an opportunity for somebody in our technical team to share something with everyone else in the organization. And so the working group actually put together a lightning talk to talk through everyone about what their findings were with Kotlin. What was actually bad with it? Where did we actually have problems testing out some of these things? And then also drawing some conclusions as part of that. And so that was kind of some of the formulation of our working group as part of that. Now, after this initial working group, uh, we then decided, do we want to continue on with this exploration, or do we want to say we've had enough data and we're not yet so confident that let's put it on the back burner for, say, six months or not? Um, fortunately, the data actually showed our team was pretty happy with it. It seemed to be pretty easy for everyone to learn. And we said, OK, well, let's take this exploration a little bit further. And so we actually then had another get stuff done days trial where um, we were trying to tackle more complex problems. So in the first round, uh, we were sort of doing, I guess, Kotlin 101, right? What everyone was doing, where everyone was doing the how do you represent these ideas in this language. This round was actually more about now apply it to much more complex problems in our environment. So I think you can learn a programming language pretty quickly at the basics, but the question is, how does it handle the complexity of your domain and your product area in a much uh, more complex fashion? And so Get Stuff Done Days round two was actually trying to take something complex like a small microservice or environment, completely convert it into Kotlin and see what broke. <laughs> Now, one of the interesting learnings that we had as part of this was actually Kotlin doesn't work very well with Lombok. So those of you who use Lombok, annotation processor, that stuff is kind of built in with Kotlin, and so it was a bit of an issue when we actually started to do this. We also tested to see how well it would work across the full stack from end to end with things like Hibernate uh, or um, other sort of frameworks and libraries we had, and we found some interesting places where it would actually break as well. And so these were interesting data that we could actually take back to the group and say, is this a concern? We use these libraries or frameworks quite heavily. Is this going to be a big problem if we, if we uh, take it? Or is this actually something we can work around or we can find a migration approach? Now, during this Get Stuff Done days, I have to actually do a call out to our tech team as well, as one of our teams actually decided to write a new feature for our app. Uh, it's called Discrete Mode, uh, and I think it's actually a pretty cool idea that our team actually created. So when you have the app, you can actually just wave your hand over it, and you can sort of blank out numbers. So if you're on the public transport, you can actually then interact with the app without actually having numbers there. And so these are actually cool sort of ideas that our um, tech team has, and I think it's pretty cool. But back to Get Stuff Done, uh, Back to our Get Stuff Done days is, as we collected more data, one of the things we were trying to do was go back to thinking about what were the worries we had as an organization, and then think about how are we going to address each of these things. Were these things that were completely not solvable, or were these things we had to wait for the community to solve, or for the uh, programming language uh, creators to solve as well? So were there things like compatibility with libraries in our general ecosystem? Fundamental frameworks and tools that we use for monitoring logging that we didn't want to write because they're not key business um, uh, competitive advantage features for us. Uh, we wanted to understand the end-to-end -end consequences as well, right? So not just writing uh, a Hello World app, but actually in production with a Kotlin service. How does it actually perform? What is our feedback loop as an engineer? How quickly can we make a change, test, compile, deploy, and get feedback about the entire organization, right? So uh, what does that developer experience look like? And we wanted to really make sure that that works. And then also, what things come with the ecosystem that we weren't going to expect? So was there uh, additional baggage? Fortunately, with this Get Stuff Done days, um, I think we actually were pretty happy with this. And one of the things I actually did at the time was uh, play around with some of the Kotlin Cohen's as well. So as much as I trust my team, I'm still a programmer at heart, and I really wanted to actually get an understanding for it. And it's a really great way of going through uh, learning a new language. Now, when I was learning other previous languages, like Ruby or various things, you know, you used to have articles, but obviously the idea of test-driven learning has really stepped up. 
So you can actually just download or clone a repository. You then have a series of tests that you can run really quickly. And it's built in a really nice incremental style of going from the simplest concepts, like you know, how do you write a function? How do you represent data? How do you do a class? And then you build up to much more complex topics like functional and list and um, yeah, much more complex different uh, features of the language. So highly recommended if you want to play around with it. And it was one of those things where I also wanted to have personal confidence in the language as we did that. And so we had the Cohen's, uh, and we did this, um, I did this as well on the weekend. Uh, and then we got together as a working group. And as part of this, we then started to discuss what were our observations, what were the pros and cons, and then did we actually want to go yay or nay? Now, this was actually quite a key time because I think this is the time where we wanted to say, we don't want to delay the decision, we want to be clear on this, but we wanted to do it in such a way that we've done our sort of homework and made sure we took a data-driven approach to testing out the adoption of this language to address all fears. Uh, and so we actually made sure that when we went into that meeting, we had things like, what would be the decision-making process for this? How many people did we need to have, representatives from across the technical organization, how many people would actually vote? What would we need? So it's not just more than 50%, but actually we needed a significant majority, like 75% is kind of the number we ended up with. And we really wanted to make sure that there was gonna be enough buy-in to understand what that meant. So good things happened, and we ended up deciding as an organization that we were gonna go with Kotlin. Um, interestingly, we had a, a nine out of 10 people actually vote strong yes, and the other person was a bit more, hmm, we'll see, right? So it wasn't even a no from that perspective. And so we, had a made, we made a decision, and then I made the announcement to the entire organization. So this is the email I sent out to everyone. So programming language transition, uh, we're moving from trial to adopt. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this language, this comes actually from the tech radar concept. Uh, so this radar concept comes from ThoughtWorks, and their idea is to help give people guidance in an organization about what state is technology in, in that organization. Now, you can't simply remove a service from some tool that you don't want to use anymore. You have to deal with that as legacy, but you don't want to obviously add more to it. And so the language has interesting language, so that the radar has interesting language like hold, right? We don't want to do any more Scala microservices. Um, we want to assess, and this is more about like, as we were learning Kotlin, we wanted to learn a little bit about it. We don't want to actually put anything in production yet, but we're in a phase of testing it out and learning about this. Trial, uh, for us, meant actually we were going to take a service, deploy it into production, and gather real information here, but it's not suddenly a, everyone can write every service in whatever they like with the tool. And uh, adopt for us then meant, okay, now it's a green light for everyone. And so, uh, with the quorum and the decision for deciding in Kotlin, then we decided to make that transition from trial to adopt. Um, so it, that wasn't enough, obviously, to just say, now you can do Kotlin. We wanted to make sure that people had a good chance of success. And this is something you'll want to think about if you're adopting something. Make the right thing easy and make that right path clear. So we had a couple of different rules. So one of them was avoid mixing Java and Kotlin in your services. So if you have an old Java service, don't suddenly convert it all to Kotlin or convert half of it to Kotlin. We had a rule of you can build new microservices in Kotlin. If you have an existing one, please stay in Java uh, for now or think about your migration path right? until you have a clear plan. Um, we did say it's okay to start mixing source code. So Java source is okay and then start to convert Kotlin uh, tests into Kotlin and then we'll learn more about maybe other breaking points as well. Um, the other interesting thing that we did was not say everyone must use Kotlin, but actually that Kotlin is an opt-in, right? So for teams that weren't yet ready to go on the journey of learning a new language, uh, and maybe there are differences, the fear, uh, we wanted to make sure people had a safe environment to be able to learn that. So we wanted people to understand we're going to head up in the direction of Kotlin anyway, but we want to make it safe for you to learn as you go. And so we said Kotlin usage is opt-in. If you feel safer, more confident with Java, please stay with Java, that's completely fine as well. Now, as part of the process of sort of expanding, we then also wanted to make sure that people learned about Kotlin. So we started to plan some training within our organization where some of our en engineers started to do some lightning talks about the basics of Kotlin, right? Comparing Java to Kotlin, how you would do this thing, some of the interesting lessons learned along the way, and then uh, spreading some of that knowledge. And then we also started to have people who were uh, um, sort of key points of Kotlin knowledge in the organization where people could reach out to. And so 
We use lightning talks as a way of repeating this information, sharing more lessons learned as we've adopted it. Now, we've gone on a bit of a journey. You've learned a lot of information. You're probably interested to ask, well, how has it gone? Right? So what is the outcome? So we've now been doing Kotlin in production for more than a year on our backend services. Uh, and I think a test from our team seems to be, everyone seems to be pretty happy. Our team seems to be pretty productive. So our team on the back end hasn't really had any issues with this. I did some statistics out of our um, repositories. Um, so if you think about the number of different repositories we have, uh, we now have about 62 different types of services with Java as the back end. And we now have about 49 that have already been totally converted to Kotlin or started in Kotlin originally. So this is about 45% of our um, backend services are now Kotlin based. Um, our Android app is very interesting as well because uh, our Android app has been around for quite some time and it's quite large with about 180,000 lines of code. Um, but our team has actually been slowly migrating Android. By its nature, it's a monolith, so you can't get away with that. And uh, we have now about 50% uh, Kotlin on the Android app as well. And our team, our Android team, seems to be very happy with that. So we made a choice, and the question is, uh, looking back, what would we do differently, or what have we learned? So one of the interesting things I've learned is actually it's really good to have a data-driven process. And I want to sort of highlight it needs to be good enough, right? So you can spend a lot of time gathering data, but of course you'll always have imperfect information. But I think it's very helpful if you're going to present a case to some of your organization that you've actually gathered information in your environment about how it applies to your context. Um, one of the things that I was really thinking about was the balance of what is it for our culture, right? So does it fit our culture? If you're a very functional shop, maybe it's not right fit. Or if you're very, very just Java only, maybe it's not a good fit as well. A real key emphasis we had during the entire selection process is that language is an enabler for value. It's not a substitute for value. So adopting a new language itself doesn't bring value. We wanted people to make sure they could actually do and solve interesting business problems with that and make sure they can do that. Um, and to make sure that there are no significant blocking issues from that perspective. And so I think these were some of the lessons learned that we found were actually really helpful in choosing a new programming language. And I hope that's actually useful advice for you and your organizations if you're trying to convince people to adopt Kotlin. Now, one of the quotes I like to talk about is, we don't pick uh, tools because they are shiny, new, or theoretically better. We pick tools because they help us solve customer problems in a simpler and clearer way. And for us, Kotlin has been a very great way of doing that. Thank you. <laughs>